This is Longcut End Viaduct Bridge near Dewsbury. This is Rose Beck Bridge near Chandwell. This bridge is Dewsbury. This bridge is Chandwell. Welcome to Chandwell. In this episode, I'm going to show you the stages that I went through to build this wonderful iron arched bridge based upon that one near Dewsbury. I'm going to show everything from the initial design of the bridge to construction of the arches, the placement of the bridge and the final finishing off. I think there's something here for everybody, so do watch along. If you like what you see or you just want to see the continued evolution of this inner city viaduct based N-gauge layout, then please click the subscribe button. I was fascinated by this bridge when I saw it and I really wanted to make it part of the Chandwell Viaduct. If you want to see how I did it, then follow along this video as we go through the stages of its construction. Stage 1. Design the arch components. All of my scratch builds start in an application called Inkscape. It's a wonderful drawing tool, I use it all the time. I'm not going to spend very long explaining this bit, but if you're interested in learning more, please put a comment down below and I will do a video about it in future. I started by identifying the basic shapes. I drew this pointed arch and then joined it together 11 times. This will go on either side of this lovely arch here, um, which looks about right for the size of the bridge that I photographed. Some of the little bits are possibly overscale, but I've gone as small as I possibly can. Those uprights there are just 1.3 millimetres wide. Next, I worked out how to put them together. I'm going to put each girder together out of three layers of 0.5 millimetre card. This one on the bottom, then this one on top of that, and then this one on top of that. I colour the shapes in with some textures that I've downloaded from a royalty free texture website. I had a simple highlight and a simple shading, just to fool the eye into thinking it's looking at something in relief, in far more 3D than it really is. This is a wonderful technique that's really easy to do, and once it's printed out, especially in end scale at this size, it's really, really effective. I repeat the process on the green, and it looks like this is now made out of some kind of eye beam rather than just a flat piece of green metal. I print this onto matte photo paper on an inkjet printer and then stick it to half millimetre card. Cover the card in glue stick and then roll the paper on. Give it a good roll down. Stage 2. Construct the arches. So we're ready to cut these out. Here they are, they're on half a millimetre card and it's just a case of using a scalpel to cut round them. These are really thin, these are just 1.3 millimetres wide, so I'm going to need to be really careful here not to slice straight through them. I've got nine of these to do and I don't know how long it's going to take me, so I've got a stopwatch here and I'm going to time myself, see how we get on. So let's go. First, pierce the edges with a pointy tool like this scribing tool. This gives the scalpel a good point to drop into and gives you clean points on the um, pointed arches. Another secret is to make sure that the scalpel is always sharp. I used a new blade for each one of the nine arches. And there we are. It's taken just over 40 minutes to cut these three pieces out. This one took the longest, obviously, because it's the most complex. These now need to be stuck together. So this one is at the back. This one's going to go on top of that. And then this green arched one is going to go on top of that and each of the nine arches is going to look something like that. I think that works really well and I'm happy with it. Let's return to the timer and get these stuck together. I use normal PVA glue in a fine tip applicator and take care getting the glue into the right place. I always use these little black and orange clamps to hold the things together while I'm working elsewhere. Even if they're only there for a few seconds, it really helps the glue grab both sides of the card. And 45 minutes and 14 seconds later, the first arch is done. I am really pleased with that. It's gone together better than I could have hoped. It's really sturdy. Um, it's quite solid. It's got a really good feel to it. It looks really delicate. 
um, which is the look I was looking for. And I think it's going to work really well. The underneath of the girder needs to be covered in a strip of green paper, but I'll do that last once the buttresses are in place. Stage three, work out the skew. The bridge is going to carry the railway across the river at an oblique angle, so it's going to be another skew bridge. This piece of paper represents where the river is going to be, and I've drawn around the track bed so that I can plan the skew. I've printed off a template here with the placement of the arches at the correct width, and I've tried different variations to see which one works the best. I discovered that a skew of 46mm works the best, so the arches move from right to left by 46mm from front to back. To match the rest of the viaduct, the bridge needs to be 104mm wide. To that end, I've created this template here. This is the correct length and width for the bridge to fit in, and it will be the top of the bridge, the underside. The arches will fit on it like this, and I've marked out the correct positions for the skew. As with some of my other arches, I've got holes here to contend with. These will have the piano wires in, which will control these points here. So I just need to be mindful of that. I don't want to have one of the uprights of the buttresses on top of the hole. Stage four, make the buttresses. I designed the arch to be embedded in the middle of the buttresses. I wanted to make sure that the arch would be dead center in the buttress and that I could control the exact width of the bridge by calculating the exact width of the buttress. So using those calculations, I've created these pieces, which I'm now going to glue together um, to make one single arch embedded in its buttress. So I have eight of these pieces. These are two millimeter card. There will be two on each side of the arch on each edge. And I've got four of these. These are half millimeter card. The two, two plus the one half all add up the exact width that the buttress needs to be so that the eventual nine arch bridge is the correct width. These bits are just spaces. These are the same half mil card that the arch is made from and they just basically go in the bottom to pad it all out. So the arch gets added here and then the spaces go underneath. So we should end up with a nice solid structure with the arch dead center in its buttress. I also add another piece of, of the green arch on the rear. The layout will never be seen from the back, but just in case I ever photograph it from there, then that will cover it. So lots of bits to add, let's go. The technique here is just the same. Very, very carefully using a scalpel, I cut out the green arch and paste it on. It doesn't have to be super, because it's just from the back. Um, and then it's a case of adding each individual piece of the buttress. I work from one side to the other, flip it around, then do the same on the other side, building it up as I go, trying to keep it as square as possible. And what I end up with is this. It's solid, it actually stands up by itself, and you can see that the arch is dead center in its buttress. So that worked. And it looks even better when you see them together. Here are the first seven. Um, all the hard work is starting to pay off. I'm getting quite excited about how this viaduct or how this arch is going to look. These look absolutely fantastic. So it's time to take these bare buttresses and turn them into buttresses covered in the dark random ashlar texture to match the rest of the viaduct. The buttresses are going to go together like this to make the skew of the bridge. So to that end, I've got these three pieces. I've got a main piece here, which will wrap around the front and the inner face. This piece here, which will go on the inner face on the other side of the arch, and this bit, which should make a nice triangular stone piece to hold the arch in place. The coverings are scored and pre-folded to give nice crisp edges once they fit around the buttresses. This bit here, I've cut a little bit too big, I just need to trim it off so that it fits nicely up against the inner edge of the white pointed arch. The first task though is to sort out the straight edges on the buttresses. They're made from several layers of card all stuck together and no matter how careful you are you always end up with a bit of a wonky line like this. It's only fractions of a millimetre but it does make a difference once the coverings are put on. 
So to get rid of that, I just use a simple nail file and rub it down until I've got a nice, straight, perpendicular, smooth edge. A pair of tweezers like this comes in really handy when placing um, the coverings on the buttresses. I also use these um, Winsor Newton or Letra Set Pro markers. Um, there's two colours here. Um, what I do is I colour around the white edges of the paper. That just really takes away the white edge. Once it's in place, you can't really tell that it's an extra layer of paper on top of the buttress. And then when there's a layer of varnish on top as well, it really does blend it all together. And it's really important to get rid of those white edges of the paper. This one here, Cool Grey 4, is a really good match for the dark random ashlar, the bricks. And Cool Grey 2 is good for the bit of stone which is going to be holding up the arch. When filing with a nail file like this, it's really important not to introduce a curve to the buttress and try and keep it perpendicular to the rest of the structure. I'm using my fine tip applicator as before um, and applying PVA glue. I'm also spending a lot of time trying to get the edges perfectly lined up to the inner edge of the arch. It involves quite a bit of trimming and quite a bit of poking with the uh, tweezers, but eventually I get there. So after the first two pieces are applied, we've got something that does approach looking like a buttress. We now need to get this triangular piece on. I want this to look like one big block of triangular stone, like what is on the actual bridge itself. I've cut this little piece out of some of the Scale Scenes Dark Random Ashlar Sills texture. It looks a good approximation of the stone that I want. Hopefully it will slot around the arch and then fold across to make it look like um, a triangle. The first thing to do though is to run around the edges, the white edges of the paper with my cool grey 2 pen and then we'll stick it into place, fold it round and see how it looks. It can feel quite tedious working with such small pieces of paper and large pens but the ink comes out of these pens so nicely it works really well. I used a lot of glue here just to give it some um, moisture and it really helps when smoothing down this kind of work. And what we end up with is this. This does look like one large block of stone. It's exactly what I wanted. It looks good. I've had to touch up the edges a little bit more with um, some extra pen and some of the glue is shining on the brickwork. This disappears though once I've added the gloss varnish and then the matte varnish on top. When these go together like this, it's going to work really well I think. So this is the first one done. I think I've got about another 17 to go. Um, this one took 20 minutes, so a lot of time ahead of me. So I'd better make a start. So after doing 17 of these things almost perfectly, the very last one is on the front arch and it's therefore the one that's most visible and I've mucked it up. I managed to get it on wonky and didn't notice until long after the glue had dried. So I scraped it back a little bit and I was considering putting an extra one back on top. The problem with this though, I thought, is if I didn't get it exact, you'd see the other one poking out underneath and it would look like a kind of a patch on top. So what I want to try first is just basically scraping off some of the surface of the print and then just using the Winsor & Newton Pro markers, just dabbing them on in a mottled kind of pattern. I wanted to see what that would look like. Um, and what I came out with is this. This looks okay. It doesn't look too great here on the screen, but in real life, um, at a sensible viewing distance, it looks good. Um, so I'm going to leave it. I think once it's varnished, it'll look fine. So we've got nine arches, all with their buttresses wrapped. And it's time for the last bit of the puzzle. I need to put a covering on the underneath of the beam to make it look like the entire arch is built out of one piece of painted iron. To that end, I've cut these little strips. They're about two millimetres wide. I've not bothered measuring them, I've just done it by eye, chopping it out of um, a piece of the green girder texture that the arch itself is made from. I'm just going to basically stick these to the underside of the arch. As before, to remove the white edge of the paper, I need to colour it in. And this lovely Crayola Silly Scents pen is the closest match I could find. The benefit of this is it smells lovely whilst I'm doing it. And to make sure I've got a decent surface onto which to stick my little strip, 
the first thing I'll do is I'll get the trusty nail file out and I'll give it a good filing down to give it a smooth level surface to stick onto. It's a right pain trying to get a two millimeter wide strip of paper held whilst running a felt tip pen across it, but you get there in the end. The glue at the fine tip applicator, again, it's just normal PVA. I put it on quite thick. Um, I wanted it damp. Um, that way I can slide the piece into place more um, and I get nice smooth edges to it once it goes on. So there we are, it's complete. The bit of stone that I mucked up is looking fine um, now um, and the green bit on the bottom has um, blended in really nicely with the rest of the arch. I did use a wetted finger just to merge it together with the um, felt pen um, and I think it's really worked so this is going to look great once it's on the layout. So there we are, a quick test with them all in place. It's looking great. I love the fact that you can see down these arches like this. Um, it's wonderful. Um, really pleased with how it's looking. So now what we need to do is go and get them looking more like a bridge and get it under the layout. So on to the next part. Stage five, construct the bridge. It's time to construct the bridge. We've got the nine arches and we've got the template I showed earlier. I'm not going to use PVA today, I'm going to use super glue. The reason being I want to get it stuck as quickly as possible and as straight as possible. Because this is the underside of the bridge, if everything lines up here then I know it's going to be correct underneath the track bed. So I started gluing the arches in place. I took extreme care to get them straight and to get them lined up, lined up onto the guides that I'd created. I took care to press them together as well and to make sure that I was building a solid structure. What I didn't take extreme care of though is to make sure that they were actually at 90 degrees to the board itself and I was introducing an ever so slight twist to the bridge. It wasn't really obvious until I placed the bridge under the layout and it wasn't a major problem in the end. But if I were to do this again, I would take more care at this point and perhaps not use super glue. And we ended up with this, almost exactly as I was intending. Really happy with it. It's nice and flat on the top. It's going to go into the layout really well. And it really looks good. I'm absolutely over the moon. So we can press on and get it underneath the layout. Stage six, position the bridge. So as with the rest of the layout, I've built this bridge a few millimetres shorter than the gap between the baseboard and the track bed. That just helps me get it into the right place more easily and it helps me get the top of it aligned with the baseboard correctly. On this side of the bridge we've got the added challenge of these wires coming from underneath the baseboard and going up to the track. I've already cut a notch out the bottom of here just to help these ones go through, but we've got more of a problem towards the top. These wires join the track bed right where the top of the buttresses are, so I'm going to need to do some surgery to the bridge at this point. And I'm afraid to say that surgery isn't pretty. Uh, it's really difficult to cut solid card that's been stuck together um, with super glue, PVA and then varnished. But here we are, I've made a slot, the wires fit in nicely and it works okay. These square holes are for the piano wire which is going to control the points up above. So I'll show you that now. Eventually Chandwell's points are going to be controlled from servos beneath the board via 1.5mm piano wire like this. I decided that instead of trying to construct the viaduct in such a way that the rods are hidden, I'm just going to have them on shore. They're not going to be that noticeable. And here with the bridge in place, I've proven that it works. So with that done, I've glued the bridge to the underside of the track bed. I'm holding the bridge in place on stacks of card just to keep it pressured up onto the top of the baseboard. There's a bigger gap at the front than there is at the back. That's a result of the twist that I managed to get into the bridge as I was gluing them together. It shouldn't be too noticeable once we see it finished. Stage seven, add the finishing touches. So now it's time to put the finishing details in place and I'm starting off with this valance. 
just to cover up the gap underneath the buttresses, even though it's going to be underneath the river, which is going to be here. It's going to be underneath the waterline. I'm putting on a little valance. To that end, I'm just using a strip of half millimeter card covered in the bricks and cutting it into small pieces and gluing it at the foot of each buttress. This is the strip I'm using. I'm just doing it by eye, just putting it up, measuring it with the scalpel and then just chopping it off. With the exposed card edges coloured in with the brown letter set pro marker, it's impossible to see that it's just an exposed bit of card underneath there. To the naked eye especially, it looks fine. So they're all done and the bridge is looking good. You can't see that it's twisted, you can't see that it's out of true, um, it looks absolutely fine. The valance has just finished it off nicely. Everything looks nice and straight and I'm quite pleased with it. So we can move on to finishing the bridge off now. All that's left is to ballast the track and then put the fences along the top. Because the bridge is straight and the track bed is curved, there are gaps that need to be filled. I use Billy Putt to fill these in. This is a two-part epoxy substance. Um, it's made of two different parts, a bit like plasticine. You mix them together and then push them into place just like you would with plasticine and it dries rock hard. So I'm going to fill those gaps in now, starting by cutting off two equal parts of the substance and mixing it together. So here we are, a ball of plasticine type substance which I'm going to put into the gaps. There's quite a few, um, just along here in front of the top of the bridge and then round here into these gaps here. The idea is we just don't want any ballast to fall down these holes. While we're watching me filling in these holes it's worth pointing out that um, I missed a little bit of the bridge build. You'll have seen across the top, up to the height of the track bed, I've put a little bit of green um, iron girder in place with a little concrete wall behind it. Um, this is just to give the front fascia some kind of depth. And it looks as close as I can get it to the real bridge in Dewsbury, which does seem to have some kind of concrete plinth behind the front of the arch. So I didn't record that bit, but you can see it there in place. And I think that looks about right. The holes are filled, the ballast is laid and is drying, and now it's just the fences. I bought these brass ones online from a retailer called N Brass Locos, and it's definitely worth looking at, there's some fabulous things on there. These are actually traffic fences, but they're the closest I could see to the ones that were on the real bridge at Dewsbury. I don't have an airbrush or any aerosols, I've just brush painted these. I used some surface primer underneath, and then some white paint I'm gonna put on top. Once that paint is done and dry, I'll start putting them on the top of the arch. I fixed the first piece of fence dead centre in the arch and then added the second and third pieces upside that. By starting in the centre, I get it so that the edges are equal if there isn't a full piece of fence that fits on. I simply used my pin vise to create holes at the right spacing for the fence. I kept slotting it in, in between each hole to make sure they're in the right place. After a test fit, just used little tiny drops of super glue, just dropped it into place. The super glue grabs it really tight, especially if the hole is quite small and it just slots into place and stays put. And then with one more hole and a few more drops of glue, it's time to add the final piece of fence. This bridge has taken five weeks to build and I'm finally here at the end I think it looks fabulous. I couldn't be happier with it. If you found this video interesting, please consider subscribing to the Chandwell channel by clicking the Class 47 logo in the circle just down below. The next video should see the completion of the viaduct. Just three more arches to go. We'll see you then. Thank you for watching.